Our next group is a panel. Uh, introduce the moderator, Shirley Malcolm, from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the panel is titled, Changing the World, One Invention at a Time. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here, and I'd like to uh, ask my panel members if they would come up. Can you give me that chair? Um, we have with us today uh, three of the members of the inaugural class of the AAAS Limelson Invention Ambassadors Program. And for us, this is a, it's a real honor to be able to have our uh, cohort, three of the members here. Uh, a lot of people look and they say AAAS. They do science. They don't do invention, do they? At which point I say, well, you have to look at our roots. A lot of people don't realize that Science Magazine is actually a product of Thomas Edison. And that when he got into financial trouble, Alexander Graham Bell helped bail him out. So we have deep roots in the whole area of invention. Uh, I, as, a, as the person who heads education at AAAS, I have an opportunity to go and talk to graduate students and, and undergraduates. And in many cases, I talk to them about careers. And in so many cases, where I'm talking about career options, invention never really pops up in entrepreneurship. And I think that this is often a reflection of the fact that students are at a distance from this. And so in the conversation that we're gonna have, we're gonna, I want us to talk a little bit about this. The way that this panel will go is that our ambassadors will uh, give you and a kind of an eight minute rundown who I am and what I did and what I do and my, um, and then we will explore a little bit about the ambassador experience. And then we will have a little bit of kind of crosstalk, but I wanna be able to open this up to the audience so that you can not only know what their experience has been like as ambassadors, we want you to kind of think that it's cool enough that some of you might wanna be ambassadors and nominate your colleagues, nominate yourself, uh, somehow get ahead of us so that we can really begin to push this message out about the power of invention to really change the world, one invention at a time. And so we have uh, our own Paul Sandberg here. You notice I didn't say Sandberger. <laughs> okay, and then we have uh, two individuals who are going to be inducted. Uh, Karen Berg from Kansas State and Rory Cooper from the University of Pittsburgh and a whole bunch of other institutions and organizations in Pittsburgh. So, who wants to start off? Okay, Rory. <laughs> I was gonna say Paul, but... Uh... Well, great. Um, well, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, so obviously the, the weather's wonderful, and I grew up in California, so it's always, always nice to come home as well. Uh, let me put a little bit of uh, my work in context. So I'm a biomedical engineer. Um, I don't work in the uh, basic science pharmaceutical area. I work in providing assistive technology for people with disabilities. Uh, my early interest in invention started out in some ways for obvious reasons. Uh, when I was um, injured while serving in the Army, I came home and, and wheelchairs weighed about uh, 80 pounds, and I weighed about 100 pounds after I got out of the hospital. I'm, I've bulked up a little bit since then. And uh, it was difficult to, uh, to push the wheelchair and load it in a car, and, and that got me early started on a career of invention. What I learned later is that um, the World Health Organization reports that about 70 million people in the world are in need of a wheelchair, and only about 20 million people have access to a wheelchair. And what I mean by saying access to a wheelchair is that they don't necessarily own one, but there's an institution where they can use one or they can share one with somebody. And that the wheelchairs are not actually equitably distributed 
because about 8 million of the 20 million wheelchairs that are in use in the world are in use in the United States and Europe. So that leaves a good portion of the globe uh, underserved. The problem gets even more complicated. Uh, there are only about 6 million wheelchairs that are produced in the world each year. About 3 million of them are produced in China. And those wheelchairs last about three years. So I know you've had lunch, it's in the afternoon, so you don't have to do the math. But that means there's only about 18, you know, so the 20 million wheelchairs basically means there's 18 million wheelchairs. They all lasted three years. Some last a little longer than three years. And so uh, that gives us 20 million. You'll never get to 70 million because they just don't have the production capacity and, they don't, and they're not evenly distributed. So uh, that's part of the work that I do. Uh, we were just recently at the University of Pittsburgh awarded a large uh, grant from the U.S. Agency for International Development in order to address this problem. By, uh, and there's, a, there's, a, there's actually a dual problem uh, here because I just talked about the availability of wheelchairs, but the availability of the clinicians or professionals that can provide them is actually even worse. For example, in the whole continent of Africa, there are less than 10 physical medicine and rehab physicians. There are probably more than that in Pasadena. There are the shortage of physical therapists, occupational therapists worldwide. Even in the United States, uh, Medicare uh, said that in, uh, in 2006, that in order to improve the quality of wheelchair provision in the United States, that the individuals that were getting a rehab chair in comparison to what's called a depot chair, a depot chair is what you see in hospitals to sort of transport people from one room to the other. A rehab chair is a chair that you would, like my own, use for your own personal use. Uh, would have to be, uh, you'd have to see an ATP, assistive technology professional. So there are about 5,000 of them in the United States and most of those are in the large cities. So even in our own country, you can't get access to the professionals to provide them. So that, uh, that's part of my motivation. The other motivation is uh, uh, my wife is here with me today. Uh, she is a physical therapist and she runs our University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Center for Assistive Technology, which is uh, one of the largest outpatient assistive technology clinical services um, in the United States. And uh, um, we, we carpool together. We're both professors at the university. So about 90 minutes a day, she tells me all the problems I need to be working on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, I think that's, especially as engineers, that's really important. I think for all inventors, it's, um, we all know the saying, necessity is the mother of invention, but I think what's really important is also being connected uh, to the problems and to the end users. You saw in our last, that last presentation, you know, the emails once the drug became available, uh, I think what's also important though is having that demand up front. So that actually drives a lot of our, in, uh, in a lot of my research and my inventions is, is basically what you, what you might want to call consumer or clinical need. So we work in, I've done work in robotics, wheelchairs, cognitive aids, uh, all as a result of the, the increased demand through an aging population in America, through a shortage of wheelchairs in the world, through uh, the needs of our uh, war injured uh, veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and, and other countries around the world uh, in need of new technologies. And I, I think our ultimate goal is to uh, uh, provide uh, full participation in society and a, and a, and a worthwhile and fulfilling life. Uh, and before I uh, yield, uh, I'd like to talk to you too about um, what's really cool at the University of Pittsburgh. We got a new chancellor uh, last summer. Uh, Pat Gallagher, some of you might know him, he came from uh, the Department of Commerce and NIST. And um, he created a really exciting program uh, called the Innovation Institute at the University of Pittsburgh to, uh, to actually not only recognize innovation, but to stimulate innovation. And uh, in working with him, we uh, decided that you can't really be a passive organization in order to do innovation. Uh, it's, you know, one thing is people, will file invention disclosures, but a lot of faculty and postdocs and students don't even know when to file an invention disclosure, what is an invention disclosure, 
talking about you know not disclosing and like we just heard about uh, once you do actually license that you do want it a two-way street so we've actually done some of the same things where we have data data sharing agreements or access to data even once a product comes to market so the first traveling circus was actually is being done in right now in my lab and it's pretty exciting and so I know some of you are um, VPs for research or vice provosts for research and so I'd like to plant this seed in your head. So the, uh, we're doing this 10-week uh, traveling circus. So they come to a lab or a department or a center with the uh, technology transfer staff. They talk about filing an invention disclosure, uh, actually how to, light, how to do a patent, how to do consumer surveys. They actually force you to go out and interview people about your, your product and your device. And uh, to make it further, our, um, they're giving every, everybody that files an invention disclosure and goes through this 10-week process gets $3,000 to help move their invention forward. But then there's a competition. If you have 10 or more inventions in the group, uh, then you can compete for $10,000 and you get three $10,000 winners and one $50,000 winner. So it's, what's amazing is that as we announced this and said they were coming, um, we had five people immediately file invention disclosures. We're about seven weeks into the process and they've um, filed patents on those and, th and two of them are already licensed and uh, as preliminary patents. And one of them um, will be licensed, but there are actually multiple companies interested, and so we're in that negotiating process to see what's the best deal. What I also think is really exciting about it is that uh, all, of the, all of the teams have a student, a faculty member, and then an executive and residence mentor. And I'd be willing to bet that two or three of those the students will take them and create businesses. And uh, that's kind of my, also my other sort of parting thought is that uh, in our field, at least in assistive technology, rehab engineering, this, the, the idea of doing engineering and working on the public good, so sol you know, solving, doing well, doing good by doing well, or doing well by doing good, attracts a lot of students to this field but what I also see exciting is them creating their own job opportunities by taking intellectual property from the university, competing in these innovation competitions, and then um, and in our state, several of them are also then competing for uh, technology or life sciences uh, startup funds from the, from the state in order to uh, actually launch their own business and create their own jobs. So for me, that's what's exciting to, uh, I, I, I tell people, uh, we have a McGowan Institute that does regenerative medicine, and on, for some reason, I, I often get paired with the director of the McGowan Institute to give talks. So I, I'm into sort of instant gratification. We do products and projects that help people in the short term, where they work on, on really long term projects, but one of the most rewarding things is to go around and see uh, people using your technology, benefiting from your technology, and when they find out you inventing it, hearing about their experiences with it. So thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, that was actually the perfect segue, and you'll see why in a, in a couple minutes. But uh, I'm also a biomedical engineer. I'm Karen Berg. I serve as the vice president for research at Kansas State University. And so when Rory said, here's something for the VPRs, I was afraid he was going to ask for money or permission not to include indirects in a, <laughs> in a grant, because uh, that's the a lot of what I usually get in a day. Um, tell you a little bit about my path. I, for those of you that are in the biomedical implant space, you probably knew my advisor, uh, Shallaby Shallaby, who studied in New York, New York, and worked for Johnson & Johnson, and was a <laughs> PhD, PhD, and I don't make this up. And he's also the inventor of record of, on uh, many of the patents that were issued for absorbable technologies, particularly in the suture area. And so I was fortunate to almost trip into his office when I was a, a graduate student at Clemson University. And Clemson had had the uh, really unique, at that time, foresight to hire somebody directly from industry. And that was not without controversy. And so I actually worked for him. He was a chemist. 
working in an engineering college in a department where the department chair was a veterinarian. And the department had been started by a dentist and a material scientist. So go figure all of that. And me, walking in as a naive new graduate student, I thought that was normal. And so this was a wonderful type of environment in which I was trained. And so I worked for Shalaby for many years, uh, earned my master's and PhD, and really his attitude toward innovation was he lived it. And so everything he did was, it was very, he had huge business savvy, he had huge creative thought, and that's the way he trained us. He trained us by example. There were never any formal lessons. It was simply the way we lived, working, working with him. And he had an enormous group, a very multidisciplinary group, and I will say most of us were diamonds in the rough. We didn't come in with 4.0 grade point averages, but what we came in with was what he could see as street smarts, an ability, a tenacity, and ability to see the big picture with him and to get it really enthusiastic about it. So I worked with him and uh, largely, you know, very much materials focused and then moved to uh, work at a medical center where there was an enormous project in breast tissue engineering that was actually funded through a company in Boston. And many of the names that you probably all know, um, some are members and fellows of, of this organization, were on the scientific advisory board. And so me, as a, as a budding bioengineer, I thought this was absolutely fantastic to see the clinical side. I was magnetically drawn to this idea of being able to see ideas translated into reality, because that's the way Shallaby uh, trained us, was that we needed to be designing things that were being designed for a purpose, not designing giant paperweights that would win engineering or, or chemistry awards. So I worked there, and it was fantastic, because it was I worked for the chief of surgical oncology, and I worked in very much a clinical environment that had researchers who were cell biologists. I was the only engineer. And this was fantastic because, again, it was very similar to my, my graduate training with this, uh, really this melting pot of people and, and perspectives. We heard about that earlier, how uh, creation creativity may simply be differences of perspectives, um, which, again, so important having that. So for me, this was a normal way to, to thrive. But while I was there, I was, uh, part of my role was shadowing in the operating room. And so state of the art at the time, there was one researcher, one research lab that was working um, on breast tissue engineering as well. And then there was our massive project, again, stemming from a company in Boston. And state of the art was taking a material that if you imagine a, a block of Swiss cheese that has holes in it, holes throughout, um, the idea would be to take a material designed in this fashion and then combine a woman's healthy cells with that material. The material was degradable and then that would be implanted. And so you can imagine that's not a terribly good way to, to go. It was state of the art at the time, so it's easy for me to say in hindsight, but it is a large volume of material that then breaks down into products that can be detrimental to um, the woman or the patient and can actually cause negative effects and it can actually undo a lot of the good that's been caused. And so it was very limiting what one could do with that. There were a few groups that had come up with the idea of injecting gelatinous materials, degradable gelatinous materials, and that certainly from a minimally invasive standpoint was very good, but the limiting factor there is that cells in our body like to have structure. So we are structured three-dimensional human beings. Our cells similarly like to be in on a three-dimensional matrix, and they behave very differently in a gel. They don't behave normally, so they may thrive, but they're not gonna produce the things that they should produce. And so shadowing my surgeon, my mentor, and working with cell biologists and having conversations with patients was just the perfect opportunity to get little pieces of information from all different perspectives of these technologies that were being developed and to actually start formulating some ideas about how to, how to improve that. So the improvement that uh, we fashioned upon, and uh, I actually disclosed it in 1999, um, was the idea of a composite material that could be injected using something as simple as a syringe or something more complicated um, as the instrumentation, um, as, as a surgeon needed different instrumentation, but it would be comprising beads, for example, embedded in a gel, entirely degradable, and it could be changed so that it would be, it would vary depending on the need or the application because we are all very different amongst ourselves and we are all also very different from head to toe. And so the idea was to have something that was a platform technology and something that could be easily administered to the patient. And so that was the, the basic starting point for my faculty career. 
as well as many, many opportunities with, for students who looked at various facets of that particular idea. It was, it was interesting because I know we've, uh, the thought came up earlier, you know, how does an invention, how does that, you know, affect other projects, you know, in an, in an academic setting? Well, it provides so much opportunity because if you think about that particular one, Rory um, said that he works in the short term and the McGowan Center works in the long term. The McGowan Center was where I was working in that space. And so there are all these questions that have to be asked. So the, the training potential for students and the training potential to be entrepreneurs is tremendous and was tremendous. So I worked in that space, we spun out a company, but it wasn't for, we discovered, and I wish I'd met Rory earlier because he could have told me, that was the long-term space. And if you think back from the 80s up until now, think of all of the silicone scares um, that occurred along the way. So it became very difficult to market and to work with corporate America on this type of activity specifically for breast tissue engineering because there was an enormous amount of unknown and an, or an enormous amount of fear of regulatory and many other liability type, type of issues as well. We successfully translated it into other markets, bone tissue engineering for example, it was a very good one, so anywhere where there was a defect needed um, in replacement tissue. But the breast uh, tissue engineering market was extremely, extremely difficult. However, what we found was the short-term types of opportunities, so what I call widget development. So for example, we needed specialized types of containers to grow these, uh, these systems in. And so we started developing tissue culture wear that was specialized to allow multiple cell types to communicate with one another. That then turned into diagnostic technology. And so really, as frustrating as it was that the original idea was so incredibly difficult to move, it was actually kind of satisfying to know that it also helped spawn a preventative technology, namely in the diagnostic space. And so the patent actually issued, so remember we disclosed it in 1999, it issued in 2006. <laughs> so this was not an easy process either. Um, so that's on, on, the, on the technology side and the company is very successful. It is being run by uh, two of my former students and they've done exceedingly well. They also have business degrees, so they have engineering degrees coupled with business degrees, which was tremendously astute of them to uh, uh, combine uh, combine those uh, those two knowledge sets. It's um, they have partnered with a major uh, tissue culture wear company, and so have product on the market. They also do in-house uh, uh, diagnosis um, from that perspective. So they very cleverly move that along. I am exceedingly happy not being uh, not being involved in managing or, or running the company. I feel my uh, my expertise is on the training students and coming up with new ideas side, and I thoroughly enjoy that. I've moved into an administrative position. In 2006, I was an American Council on Education Fellow, and I had the opportunity to shadow uh, Dr. Clough, who was president of Georgia Tech for six months. So I followed him around in a day. I was his shadow. And then uh, President Freeman Rabowski, who's the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And the purpose was to study research institutes and study technology transfer on those two campuses. Maryland had a very exciting statewide a consortial arrangement and Georgia Tech had some fantastic uh, institute models as well. So now I'm at uh, Kansas State University as Vice President for Research and I still have my own personal uh, research in biomedical engineering, but the opportunity is tremendous uh, to be able to remove the hazing process that I felt that many of us went through to get where we are today, uh, sitting in this room that it provides an opportunity to really help define some of these systems. Rory mentioned, you know, the difficulty of, you know, faculty not knowing where to go or not even knowing this exists or that their idea is valuable, and that's so true. Um, so I would like to th say a big thank you to uh, AAAS and Lemelson for allowing us to help meet, listen to people, spread the message, um, and also a big thank you to the NAI and Paul personally uh, for making an organization like this where hopefully we all feel we're members of a team that can help demystify the process and help move, remove many of the obstacles that have existed in the past so that it can be much smoother and more collaborative going forward. So thank you. Terrific. All right. Golly, I don't know where to start. That's Dr. Berger. <laughs> Um, anyways, um, you got it. Good. 
okay. test to see who test. was here earlier. <laughs> who was here in the morning. Um, so I was really pleased when they asked me to be an invention ambassador. And um, I'll kind of start from the backside that I think what Shirley was saying about, you know, the applications are open for this year. I think it's a great experience. Uh, we, you get to go a lot of different places. You get to go to AAAS for a few days and learn how to be an ambassador, truly an ambassador, how to talk, how to speak. Uh, they bring in people from Hollywood to make sure you don't say stupid things. They bring in from the State Department uh, so you know how to do things. Uh, they should have taught me how to eat correctly, but they didn't do that. Um, so it, it really is a, a really nice thing to do, and especially if you're interested in students, in, uh, in society, and getting them kind of to understand what the invention process is and why people do inventions. And when academics do inventions, I've always found that to be extremely unique because we're not taught to be inventors. Um, we're not in companies that force us to be inventors. Our, our salaries are paid. And so we do it because we love to do it. I think someone mentioned that earlier uh, about academic inventors. Most of you don't know about me, probably what I've done. Um, and uh, I usually don't like to talk, give talks normally. I like other people to give talks and, and listen. But essentially, give you a f couple things. There's always the one thing that you want to do. I think Dr. Silverman said it earlier about the eureka moment, right? I think all of us have different eureka moments, and they, and they drive us. Um, most of us, I think someone said that inventors aren't, the academic inventors anyways, aren't driven by, by money so much, even though provosts at universities that aren't inventors, you know, think that we're all driven by money uh, as they, you know, don't want to invest in tech transfer offices. But um, I think uh, that's it. So one of the Eureka moments, let me give you a background. So most of my work was on um, neurodegenerative diseases. And um, I was actually doing the opposite of Dr. Silverman for many years in the 70s. I was trying to create increases in glutamate. Uh, I was trying to look at analogs, uh, help this, uh, to show that uh, one strong analog, canic acid, could actually induce uh, neur a neuronal loss, kind of specific neuronal loss in the brain versus doing electrolytic or heat lesions. Uh, I was looking at various neurotoxins to create specific neurotransmitter lesions uh, for, for, for making animal models of disease. Um, so in the case of Alzheimer's disease, to try to create cholinergic toxins that could destroy just uh, acetylcholine cells. And in doing epilepsy, trying to look at various excitotoxins that use glutamate to create epileptic models, for example. And then I was looking at therapeutics, and uh, we were one of the first groups, actually, probably in late 70s, to look at fetal tissue transplants. So you all remember fetal tissue transplants. We take you know, fetuses, take out bits of brain tissue from those areas, and we transplant those into um, parts of the brain that were lesioned. And it was very controversial, um, and it was uh, it, when, uh, uh, Bush took over. Um, they, you know, there was no federal funding for fetal tissue transplants at the time. And so, uh, but those were the areas I was looking at, mainly in Huntington's disease, which was being able to create a model using a, a glutamate analog, uh, and in a number of other models to see if we could replace lost brain cells, lost neurons, with fetal neurons. That was really the bulk of my early research. Um, when uh, and, and I was so involved in that and the ethics of it, believe it or not, that I ended up doing studies uh, looking at student attitudes, various attitudes to doing fetal tissue transplants. Uh, you know, questions came about would students donate cells so that their grandparents could have tissues and things like this. So, you know, some of my early papers in The Lancet, I published things like that. Uh, always was very interested in those, those concepts. Um, the other aspect really was uh, when we started looking at other alternatives of cells. So we, did some, so we did some of the first clinical trials actually in Parkinson's patients and in Huntington's patients with fetal tissue transplants funded by the NIH um, uh, when Clinton came in office because then he freed up the idea of using uh, fetal cells. Uh, 
The, we looked at other cells. We looked at the idea of using animal cells. We used polymer encapsulation of animal cells to get past the immune system because we were really looking at secretagogues from cells. So we looked at ALS patients and a number of other things. Um, and it really wasn't until uh, looking at getting to the point of trying to create a cell line because it, I think one of the difficulties was using, taking fetuses and dissecting them uh, and using them always, always affected me. And, uh, and so we were able to create the first human, with some colleagues at University of Pennsylvania, the first human cell line of human neurons grown in culture that could be grown to commercial viability. And then something happened, because I was using those cells for one thing, and my father had a stroke. And that was an area that I was not doing any research in. And, um, and I was very close to my father. And, and he had a stroke, and I was in the hospital. He was in Texas at the time. And all the medications they were using were, you know, stuff we learned for years, you know, years prior. There wasn't really anything new. And so when I got back, uh, he made it through that one. Um, I moved my lab to work on stroke. I got a grant from the American Heart Association, and no one thought that we could actually kind of do transplants in stroke, because stroke destroyed a whole area, not just, a, not just certain neurons, dopamine neurons or these. We were actually destroying blood vessels, we were destroying all sorts of things. So we did a trial comparing, we did fetal transplants, we then used this human cell line, and we actually found that were frozen and then cryopreserved and then freeze, and we were actually able to, in animal models, show that we could uh, uh, repair, in fact, some of these stroked animals. We then uh, helped form a company, uh, and we were able, we got the first approval in the 90s, actually, the very first approval to do a patient with a cell line and neural cells in uh, direct neurosurgical in a patient. And, um, and we did a number of patients with, with that cell line. Uh, we actually got some pretty good results but then funding, the funding crisis came for, for companies around that time. The dot-com hit, and so that was not able to continue, but then years later that got picked up by a British company, actually Reneuron, that is doing stroke trials, and they've licensed the patent for that using uh, other ones. But during that time, um, stem cells became very big, and so then we got into the comp There was another company I was involved with, the first publicly traded uh, company now, stem cell company. Um, and we ended up uh, doing, s really focusing in on that. Having moved to Florida by then, when the company went public, I always wanted to live in Florida, so I moved to Florida. <laughs> I thought I could, re you know, just take it easy, but not my style. And so we ended up working on, um, you know, I want to do fetal tissue, I want to do fetal, um, or embryonic stem cells, et cetera. But um, we had a Bush governor. I'm not saying I'm any way on this, but I'm using his names. <laughs> but we had a, a governor who, uh, who actually called the universities, his office, and said, is anyone doing embryonic stem cells you know, at the universities? And we weren't. So it was difficult to do that in the state of Florida, uh, especially with federal dollars. So we ended up um, looking at um, bone marrow cells. And we were the first group actually to report and patent the use of uh, bone marrow cells to make neural cells and use them for brain repair. A year later, we were the first group to look at umbilical cord derived cells and convert, transform those to neural cells and use those uh, as well. Um, of course, because of the focus on stroke, most of those trial, most of those cells we've been working and working and working away over the years, started a couple companies um, and, there, and we've licensed them out uh, and we've done the science for a lot of companies. And so there are now a number of clinical trials using s stem cell-like cells, whether they be bone marrow derived, uh, pretty soon we'll be doing cord blood derived uh, in stroke, and half of those are done from science from our laboratory. Um, we're really hoping strongly that, that these will work because, uh, as you know, you get past that three to six hour point when someone has a stroke, um, and it is very difficult. Um, so that's, that was a eureka moment of trying to really move into something. Uh, I took some of my money. We endowed a prize for my father in brain repair that's been given out for a dozen years now. Uh, and, um, 
And so that was very important. So I think those are the kind of stories that you go out there with when you're talking to the lay audience, to students, of what drives you. Uh, there's, there's other eureka moments as well for people, but that's one that drove me to uh, really focus in on those areas. I think the other thing that drove me, and I know I'm probably talking for more than six minutes now, I've got two more, is, uh, is I was the poster child of the conflict of interest at a, at a medium state school. <laughs> You know, and um, you know, especially when you're in a, you know, in a, in a medical school. And um, so, I feel that if you want to, you know, after I started to help start a few companies, I realized that patents were very important. I really didn't realize that until I was a chair of a neuroscience department. It's in, you know, uh, year, years later that I could have patented some other stuff I had and I stuff, but I learned that you could do that. And I learned that you could do it in academics. And, but then when I was doing it at a school that really wasn't supporting it, it was like, well, you only care about money, and uh, why should we support you, uh, and all those kinds of things. And so people that weren't doing it were, unfortunately, uh, naysayers. And so I guess I took it upon myself, uh, I guess, during a time that, you know what, I'm going to and I guess what politicians must get into is if you can't change the system, join them and then try to change it when you're inside. And so I ended up um, saying, well, you know what? I'm going to become an administrator as well as continue science. And so, so I became eventually you know, a, a VP in, in health and medicine. And then I got a chance to move over to the main campus. And in the main campus, it's a difficult job, as Karen knows, uh, as a VP for research. But you're in charge of the conflict of interest committee. You're in charge of, you know, all those things. And it was time to get committees and time to get people to say, that we're not going to say no, but we're going to say, how can we manage these plans? How can we do a management plan so you can do these things? If you have to say no, we have to say no, but are there management plans that we can do? And can we get sophisticated people that have done this and move forward? The other thing was, I always felt that I was walking a fine line and was not supportive, uh, supported by, by a lot of people. And uh, so, and kind of in a closet. And I thought I would come out of the closet. And one of the things that got me to come out of the closet, I thought was, let's see who the other inventors are at our university. And so, I, so when I became a VP, I, I wrote a letter, come and join me for lunch. And uh, if you have a patent and you're at our university, and I ended up having 100 people show up, faculty members at our university for lunch that had issued US patents. And we all talked about it, and we all realized that we had done this outside the norm. No one gave us credit for 10-year promotion. And we all did this because we had eureka moments that we wanted to deal with. And so that formed the nexus for starting an academy in our university. It formed the nexus for people like Howard at, at Georgetown uh, for people like, what's your name again? <laughs> George. Hi, George. At Akron, for other people to, to, to join in and say, you know, we'd like to do the same kind of thing at our university. Because it was the first group of folks across all disciplines that really got together. We ended up talking to the, uh, we went to, you remember that, Howard? We went to the USPTO. We talked to them. We said, this is what we'd like to do they took it upon themselves to, to, to embrace us. Uh, the, the commissioner, uh, the director of the USPTO at times, as I mentioned this morning, uh, embraced it. Um, and, and they said, we don't have academic inventors we work with. We have a lot of corporate inventor organizations, a lot of garage inventor organizations, but we don't have academic. We'd love you to form a national academy. We'd like to work with you. And so they came down to Tampa the, the next year, and he inducted the National Academy of Inventors to have this mission of trying to get us out. When I took him from the airport, and I said that I could, I could bring in a American Heart Grant of $100,000 know, and, and, and have that count towards my promotion and tenure, even though I was already, but I mean for someone's, or I could bring in a million dollar license fee and not have that count at all. I could spend eight years in bioscience getting a, a patent or I could spend a couple days writing a, a paper for a mediocre journal and get credit 
he was amazed. He, didn't, he had no concept. And so he ended up inducting us, and then we ended up growing. And as you've seen today from the, from the academy, at, in three years, we've become 160 universities strong and, and all the fellows here. So that's, a, that was, that's the story. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to ask one question, and then I will o open it to the audience to ask your question. And I ask you to keep your answers really brief. The one question that I, that I want to ask is actually something that Karen and I were talking about this morning. Uh, we, if we look at the individuals here, they have, they've crossed fields like crazy. And they've had to really draw on different parts of the kind of environment. And I guess the, the issue is, how do we prepare the next generation uh, of, of, of individuals who are going to enter the invention space? And uh, I want Karen to start that one for the very reason that, uh, of the comment that she made uh, this morning in that conversation. Mm, the comment that I made. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, to me, it can't be an add-on. So I was trained as a chemical engineer, and we had a senior design course. And so my first three years were studying textbook information, regurgitating it. And that was pretty pretty standard for the three years. And then all of a sudden, this fourth year, we worked with a company. A company appeared out of nowhere, and we had a project. And it was for a semester. And to me, seeming those two things together, it was like uh, an experience tacked on to the three years of you know what I perceived as my real world um, college training. And so we absolutely have to make it like oxygen so that when students walk in the door at the beginning of their first four years, that environment's already there. They're already connecting on projects across disciplines. They're connecting with corporate projects. They're connecting with application specialists, um, you know, and so forth. So it has to be, it can't be two separate experiences. It has to be very natural and part of what they, ex they don't even, they shouldn't even have to think about it in a day. They shouldn't ponder that, you know, that was remarkable. It should just be natural. Similar to, you know, what I described earlier, me walking into a multidisciplinary department and thinking that was normal. So we have to create the normal for them. Okay. The invention is norm. Okay. Paul, do you want to add anything to that? You know, we, we, we really need to reach it down and get them to just have this earlier in their education. One of the things that drives us um, it, 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 in Tampa, actually, is we have uh, in, a, an awards for kids, and we have an innovation day, and we get eight counties, and we have them, all these kids, to submit patents uh, that they actually put together and uh, in inventions. And so we have done this, and we've had over the years, this last year we had over 500 applications of kids in school submit this, and then we bring them into our business school, and then we, we have our our National Academy members at our university of, in, of, of uh, inventors, you know, kind of go through that, break it down to the top 10, and then they go through the business school to do a shark tank, and we get them in there, and we have TV personalities from Tampa and, and various people to do the shark tank, and it's a fun event. We give the school money, we give the kids money, and the whole concept is to try to get them in the inventive process early on. Kids are creative. I mean, it kind of reminds me of Art Linkletter show, you know, but... Well, uh, people haven't told them. They don't believe that they can't do things. That's right. They okay. That's right. <laughs> and so, and we do that with the undergrads. Um, we, most of the universities here have dealt with now with undergrad uh, or student incubators. This is a huge push right now in the universities. Um, I held off for a little while at our university, but then we ended up doing it with... Um, I think Mike Fountain is here in the audience. He helped out. He's a new fellow. Um, and we ended up putting a, uh, an incubator together. We said, any student companies will put you in there and we'll help you out. Uh, we had 25 applications the first year. Of, they had to be real companies. Went in there and we ended up, I think, with a dozen or 15. Uh, this year, the second year, we had put out for applications. We had 80 companies, student companies, at our university want a place in the incubator. And we ended up taking 24. There's a push out there by these students. They want this, they need this, and we need to educate them in how to do it. Okay, Rory, you want to put a period at the end of that sentence? 
Well, in, in my case, we're fortunate. Rehabilitation is a naturally a multidisciplinary field. So we have a physical therapist, occupational therapist, engineers, physicians, speech language pathologists. I think what's important is that uh, is moving those professions from teaching them in isolation to teaching them as a team, as they'll practice. I think the other thing that, that probably hasn't been taught is actually learning the language of another discipline. Yeah. So that uh, it, it's really important to be able to communicate with people from other disciplines in order to be innovative. Because I really think most of the innovation comes from uh, those collaborations across boundaries, getting different perspectives on a, a problem uh, to, um, to find unique solutions. Okay, uh, we're, while we're, I'm very conscious of time, but I do think that I need to at least take one question from the audience. Okay. I can take two questions from the audience, okay. Hi, JJ. Is it working? Hello? Yes, yes. we hear you. There's a huge challenge converting the academic inventions into products. In fact, there's a valley of death. Uh, when you think about academic invention to product. Once in a while, you get lucky, like Richard gets got, he has some friends. And personally, I've gotten lucky because I have some friends at the big company. Otherwise, most of the inventions don't see the light of the day because, and the universities are not doing a good job. So if NAI can address this and put universities on notice, they can help the nation if they can, well, uh, you know, address this valley of death type. Um, I was going to say also, just to add to that, it's refreshing to see a lot of the federal agencies as well as some philanthropic partners step up. They are heavily, heavily connected and heavily networked, and so more and more we're seeing them partner with universities. Uh, we're involved in a couple of, of those types of partnerships, and. It's, uh, I'm coming from a land grant, state land grant perspective where the mission is to educate people and to develop technologies for people. And so that's very different than, um, you know, it's a, very, it's a very specific mission. And so this is an ideal opportunity with um, funding agencies realizing, hey, we have a pretty big Rolodex, let's partner with, with universities and get those ideas out into the, into the marketplace. So yeah, I agree with you, we, we need to do more, more of that. Well, I think, um in some ways, it's, you know, the, the federal funding for research has been somewhat stagnant over the last 15 years, uh, whereas there's been a growth in corporate research. And I think, I think it's back to Paul's challenge about this universities overcoming the fear of conflict of interest and working to build partnerships with industry as another source of uh, funding to do research. So you look at, you could have, you know, you have your state support foundation support, individual philanthropy, uh, federal support, and then uh, corporate uh, funded research. And, I th and so building up that is another avenue. I also think that university, you know, a lot of the universities are really because it's the faculty and the faculty need to change. Yeah. And the, there's been a movement, I think, towards for, for, um, cre giving faculty credit for interdisciplinary research. So working with other disciplines. And that just needs to move, we need, now we need to kind of move the ball down further about measuring impact of research through innovation, through patents, through licenses. Okay, Art has the last question here. Can't hear you, is that one working? <laughs> Hello? Oh, <Yes>. perfect. <laughs> um, this is more of an observation, just to, and then following up from Shirley's question, really, about interdisciplinarity. Um, these are very, three very sort of moving stories, I thought, today, and it was great to hear Paul's origin story about NAI. I hadn't heard that before, as a matter of fact. But I'm thinking about uh, when you... Uh, when you're inventing, you're inventing two things. You're inventing disciplines. You're inventing a discipline at the same time you're inventing things. And that's kind of a double feat. And I was, I was wondering about that and how that happens. And 
I think the common feature um, among all of you is you started with this tremendous personal motivation of some kind, whether it's your, your dad and your personal life and, 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 and this, this kind of thing. And that's got to make you great ambassadors, by the way. That's, I think that's the kind of story that sells uh, for, to the public, communicates to the public. But it's that personal story. You're not there trying to invent new disciplines when you're starting, I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong about that. You're not saying, well, you know, that's, that's my goal. Your goal is to solve a personal kind of issue. And that's when you sort of cobble things together to make something new. So it's just an observation that the passion seems to be the start of it all. Oh. Well, thanks, Art. For those that don't know Art, he's, at the, he's uh, of course, head of the Lemel Center at the Smithsonian uh, and can see him on TV on the American Heroes channel. I saw him <laughs> twice. He's on there on uh, Verizon uh, there. I was watching it. Um, I, I think you're right. I think that's what I think uh, the, some of the best ambassadors, if you have stories, most people do here. Uh, that's when you go talk to these kids, you talk to uh, people in communities, you talk to corporations. We go to corporations and we talk to them. A lot of inventors at corporations don't do it because of personal reasons. They get hired in a job and they're given you know, things to do. And they're engineers or they're scientists. And, uh, and I think most of us, though, do things because we have personal passion for what we do. And that's part of the academic freedom. So I, I, so I, think, I, I think you're absolutely right. I just want to take a couple more minutes, um, if that's okay with you, Shirley. She says I'm no, but the, that's okay. I'm not the official timekeeper. I, the official timekeeper. <laughs> okay. Right oh, okay. My boss over there says it's okay. Um, the, I think what's unique about AAAS right now, um, it, you know, Alan has been a great CEO of AAAS. He stepped down uh, not too long ago. I had a chance to work with him a few times, and I was you know, on council at NIDA. But um, they now have Rush Holt, who's a former congressman. You all know Rush Holt is a new CEO. He's the executive publisher of Science and all the journals. Well, well Rush is an inventor. He has patents, and he understands invention. And, uh, and I think for AAAS to get back to some of its roots, to really talk about innovation, invention, and not just base, you know, basic sciences or things, although that's absolutely important, I think is really, really important. And uh, hopefully we can encourage him to come to uh, one of our annual meetings. Uh, we'll be back in Washington at the USPTO Department of Commerce next year. You know, every year we, we, we every other year we go back to Washington. So uh, that would be my, you know, my thing about AAAS and to understand what, what we're doing. Uh, I want you to join me in thanking our panel. Um, I want you to realize that these are just three of the seven people who are our ambassadors, that they're giving of their time and attention to go out and really be ambassadors for invention, to talk to different kinds of groups in different kinds of places all over, whether they may be policy people or university people or just people people. Uh, because I think that there's not really enough understanding that, in fact, inventors do create the future. And, and the, the kind of future that we want and, and the kinds of needs that have to be addressed are really ones that are going to require uh, a base of talent that is just not what we have right now. And I, I resonate very strongly with, with Esther's comments this morning about the, the real diversity of perspectives that we really have to get into this. And so I have been very thrilled to be able to, to work with this dynamic group. Uh, I'm not the head of this project, Yolanda Comedy is, and, and uh, I'm just a hanger on and cheerleader. Uh, and I am in fact a cheerleader because I think that this is really critical work and I value what, uh, what you do and I value what you give. And so uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today.